the series of the webinars conducted by Indian Criminology and Forensic Science Association. Transformation through technology is the need of the time. Today's speaker is Mr. Jerry Harrison, who is the Chief of Police, Independence Police Department, Kansas, USA. Mr. Jerry Harrison was appointed Chief of Police for the Independence Police Department in March 2016. Prior to that, he served in Monet, Missouri for almost 19 years. In Missouri, Jerry was his department's representative to the Law Enforcement Traffic Safety Advisory Council, the Southwest Missouri DWI Task Force, and the Missouri Coalition for Road Roadway Safety. Jerry is a crash reconstructionist, fire and emergency services instructor, grade one and two, and held certifications in Missouri as breath alcohol supervisor and trainer. Nonetheless, Mr. Jerry served eight years in the U.S. Army Reserve as an artillery man and MP. He has a bachelor's in criminal justice administration from Missouri Southern State University and a master's in criminology and criminal justice from Missouri State University. He is a certified public manager through KU, that is LELA Command School Class 4, and attended Northwestern University School of Police Staff and Command Class Number 299. Mr. Jerry currently serves as a Region 2 representative for the Kansas Association of Chiefs for Police, represents the KSCP on the Kansas 911 Coordinating Council, and is an adjunct instructor at Independence Community College and Labette Community College. Today, Mr. Jerry Harrison will be discussing on the topic community policing. Again, request all participants are requested to strictly follow the guidelines mentioned by the organizers. Now, it is the time to listen, Mr. Jerry Harrison, and I'm pleased to invite you for the session. Jerry Harrison, it's the time for you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, just to give you an idea, I don't know how familiar you are with uh, geography where I'm at, but we're pretty much in the middle of the United States. And... Um, we're, we're a rural area. Uh, major cities are a couple hours away, uh, like Wichita, Kansas City, and Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, so Wichita's in Kansas, and then Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri is a couple hours away as well. So we're we're in the country, and uh, we're doing fairly okay with the uh, pandemic that's sweeping across the world. Uh, we haven't been hit near as hard as a lot of places have been, so we've been fortunate there. Uh, today, I was invited to talk about community policing, and this is something that uh, I took on pretty serious whenever I came here to Independence. Uh, we're a town of about 9,000 people. We have 20 police officers on our department. And in the United States, every community will say that we want our department, our police to use community policing, but very few people truly know what it means. Uh, the foundation that I believe community policing comes from is in uh, Sir Robert Peel's principle number seven, where he discusses that the public are the police and the police are the public. And the only real difference is that law enforcement officers are paid full time to police the community where um, all citizens are responsible to police the community when the need arises. So when I set about developing our community policing in the direction we wanted to go, I came across a research article from 2002 by McGuire and Katz, and it's called uh, Community Policing, Loose Coupling, and Sense-Making in American Police Agencies, and that's from Justice Quarterly. And they identified, uh, you know, what are the things that community policing is to accomplish? And they looked at, uh, it allows citizens to ex express problems and needs. It allows police to educate citizens about crime and disorder, allows citizens to express complaints against police, provides a forum for police to communicate successful efforts to the public, and allows the police to work with the public to solve problems. 
And so they looked at four different areas in this article, uh, the citizens, the officers, the managers, and then the organization, the police department as a whole. So um, in the article, they had a list of uh, different things for each category. And so when we developed our program, we used these lists to guide our community and what we thought uh, would be most applicable to our community. I don't know that any law enforcement agency covers all of these, but these are the activities that the researchers used uh, to interview these police departments. And this article, it wasn't designed to test community policing. Is it an effective model for policing? Do communities that are active in community policing, do they experience less crime? And th that's not what this article looks at. This article simply looked at uh, what, is it, what is it to different organizations across the country and are they doing it? Uh, as far as the research of how impactful is community policing, I've not seen, I've not studied that myself, but I have read that communities value the relationship with the police department more than they value crime control. In other words, uh, the community would rather the police department use community policing, even if it means they're not going to have as much time to devote to crime control and, and they, the community will accept crime rates rising if they have a strong relationship with their police department and they trust their police department, which as you have no doubt seen in the news, um, trust in the police department is huge. It's, it's a very important thing. And unfortunately, right now in our country, uh, due to the George Floyd murder and the ensuing protests across the country, uh, our country is, is, has a fairly low level of trust nationwide as a rule, particularly in the urban communities. Uh, fortunately for us, in the, in the rural communities, the smaller towns, we're not having, at least in independence, we're not experiencing that blowback. Uh, we are uh, held accountable and we're expected to develop a strong relationship, but we're not suffering the same difficulties that a lot of the major police departments across the U.S. are suffering. So, uh, again, we'll talk about the four areas, citizens, officers, managers, and organizations. So. The first area of community policing is probably the most important area, at least in my mind. And that's what activities do the citizens do whenever the police department is practicing community policing. And the activities that we determined that we were gonna utilize, uh, again, we, if you go to that article, there's many more than what we're utilizing, but the ones that we utilize uh, the first one is Neighborhood Watch, and I'll assume that everyone is familiar with Neighborhood Watch, but I'll give a brief rundown on it. Uh, neighborhood Watch is br broken down into blocks, so the people that live on a section of the street from intersection to intersection on each side of the street will develop a Neighborhood Watch group. And if there's not very many houses in that area, they might be two blocks or you know a little bit larger area, but typically it's just a block and one of the citizens on that block will be elected the block captain. And so they, they are responsible to manage, uh, to keep that program going on their block. And they will have monthly get togethers. Uh, usually we'll invite the police, a police officer to the get togethers and they'll talk about crime preventative measures and that those kinds of things. And then they uh, keep an eye out on each other and agree to call the police for their neighbors when they see uh, something that concerns them. So that's pretty, that is a citizen driven activity that we facilitate. We try to keep the energy going, but we don't necessarily drive that. We also use uh, citizen volunteers. So in transparency is a, uh, of the organization is important in our community. They, the citizens want to know what's happening in the police department. They want us to be an open book. And one of the ways we do that is by having volunteers that work in the organization. The, 
theory is that your paycheck doesn't depend on this organization, so you're going to be open and honest about this organization because it's not like you're going to lose your job if you blow the whistle on problems. And so we have a reserve officer program, and these are officers that are uniformed. They have a different uniform than ours, but they, they are armed and they are trained. They don't go to the police academy and they're not certified. Uh, so they have to be with a police officer, a certified police officer at all times, a full-time officer, whenever they're out on the street working. So they don't work on their own, but they do have uh, a direct insight and involvement in police department activities. And therefore, uh, if they were to witness inappropriate police conduct, it would be much uh, less complicated for them to come forward and report it. So that's the, that's the reason we use reserve officers is to open that transparency up to our community. And again, that's a volunteer position. We have internships. We have two high school programs. Uh, one is a federal, it's funded by, by federal government dollars, and that's uh, Jobs for Area Graduates Kansas. Uh, that is a program that's for kids that probably aren't going to go to college, but they can pick up a trade. And so some of those students will uh, work with the police department to see if they want to go into the public safety field. Our high school here also requires that the seniors perform a minimum number of community service hours. So the students have to give back to the community during their senior year uh, in a volunteer, volunteer capacity. And so many of the, uh, some of these students, not many, some, will opt to volunteer with the police department as an intern under that program to get their community service hours so they can graduate. And then our local community college um, that I teach at, they have what it's a federally funded program called Upward Bound. And that is for at risk uh, high school students who's, you know, they may not make the best grades and their parents did not go to college. And so uh, it's a program that follows them through high school and channels them into the college uh, realm. And so we have interns from that as well. And I also volunteer to teach in that program. So that's uh, the first batch. The next thing that we look at, we have what's called a Citizens Academy. And uh, I don't mean to oversimplify this, I'm just not sure how familiar everybody is with each of these types of programs. But our Citizens Academy, it's again, is designed around transparency. We want our community to know what the police department is doing on the inside. So two hours a month for about two to four hours a month for about 10 months, we will have citizen volunteers that apply to go to our uh, Citizens Academy and they pass our background check. Then they will learn about once one, uh, they learn in depth about many things in our department. One is our candidate background investigations that's one of the first lessons so they find out pretty well what we do to determine if someone that applies to work for us is someone we want on our department and we have a pretty extensive background investigation process we have our canine officer uh, the dog handler will come in and give a demonstration and talk about case law uh, the legalities and technicalities of using a police dog, and then some of the different missions that the police dog is capable to perform. We, all, we will train them on our field training program. So when a police officer graduates from a police academy, he's assigned to an, he or she is assigned to an experienced police officer for three to six months as they learn the job uh, hands-on. <clears throat> the academy is more of an academic environment with some hands-on, but the field training part, when they come back to our department from academy and go out with our field training officer, that is literally a hands-on training time. And they have to accomplish certain uh, specific tasks, job-oriented tasks, in that time frame successfully to maintain their employment as a police officer. 
we give another class to the Citizens Academy about our academy training. So what's it like to be a police officer? What's it like to go through the police academy? We talk about our continuing education requirements, just like all of you probably have to do. We have to have 40 hours of continuing education training every year. For example, uh, this, this event here, I would be able to turn in as a portion of my continuing education for this time frame. We discuss emergency management with them. So uh, we have tornadoes, I'm sure you guys have heard about. I don't know that they have those all across the world, but we have them here in the Midwest and uh, we have tornado sirens and we talk about what are the rules for activating those, what scenarios, uh, what things have to be happening before we'll turn those on. And then we also uh, talk about storm spotting. So we have people that are trained to go out and observe the storm and, and uh, help guide our response. The next lesson would be taser training. So this is a taser is an electronic restraint device. I'm sure you're familiar with that as well. It stands for Thomas A. Swift's electric rifle. It comes from a work of fiction, uh, but uh, we train them on the use of force and the techniques of using the taser. And then of course the use of force standards that surround that decision. We talk about all the personal safety equipment. So for those that aren't familiar with a police officer, uh, I w when I was working the street, I wore about 27 pounds worth of gear when you talk about your utility belt, your weapon, your ammunition, your handcuffs, the uh, pepper spray, expanding baton, uh, bullet resistant vest, all the gear that I wore weighed up to about 27 pounds. So we describe that for them and what it's like to wear that around. We talk about all the different pieces of equipment that we have in our patrol cars. We talk about uh, drinking and driving enforcement and traffic enforcement. Recently, we started using drones. And so we give some in-depth training on how we deploy drones. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, we have a very, we are probably the most active department in Southeast Kansas when it comes to drone operations. We don't own any drones. Uh, they're provided to us by our emergency management, our county emergency management. So we discuss some of that so that they understand where that money comes from and that it's more or less free to the taxpayers in our community. We also use, a, we give them training in emergency medical dispatch. So our local emergency dispatchers, when you call in, on a medical emergency, they will talk you through the first aid for that particular emergency. We go into search and seizure law that's covered under the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, U.S. Constitution. We go over use of force, uh, case law, uh, and policy. So we talk about Graham v. Connor. And then uh, we go into detail about how we conduct drug and criminal investigations to some degree. Now, we don't it, many of these topics have a, uh, a section of them that's tactical that we would we don't want that to get out into the community because then that would help criminals learn how to avoid detection. And so those kinds of things we don't share. And state law allows us to keep those secrets. But what we can share, we do share. So the next thing that involves citizens is a citizen advisory council. And what we, we have two different citizen council on our department. The article talks about several different kinds, but I have a police chief's advisory committee and I meet with them once a month. And that is also a group of citizen volunteers. Typically that is populated by people that I'm not familiar with. And the, my rule for that is if I'm familiar with you, chances are you're going to call me. So I don't really worry about that. I want to reach the people that I wouldn't normally reach. And so I try to not put people on there that are friends or familiar with me. That way I expand the opportunity for citizens to contact me. But anyhow, we meet once a month and we talk about discussion topics that are important to them typically. So for example, uh, Last month, we talked about use of force and the George Floyd homicide. This month, we'll be talking about police reforms. That's the big deal right now. So many of these police reforms that are, in, that are being discussed, as, as you are well aware from reviewing research, I'm sure, these are things that have been 
well known in, in American law enforcement for a long time. And most of them have also been uh, being utilized by law enforcement across the nation. Uh, people that aren't in the profession don't study it. They're not aware of this. So this is a great opportunity for me to communicate to our community what it is that uh, you know we've been doing all along and to bring some comfort to them so that they know that their police department is responsible with the use of force decision. Um, our police chief's advisory committee, they, are the, they have the uh, priority to get into the Citizens Academy. So you, know, you have a limited number of seats, so we make sure that they get first crack at that. Uh, they help us review complaints on occasion. So if, if we get a citizen complaint against an officer and the internal affairs investigation is completed and the report's done, and when we respond back to that citizen, if they're not satisfied with how that complaint was handled, then we would take that to the Citizens Advisory Committee and share, if the citizen was willing to do this, we would share their complaint with them. Otherwise, we keep it, keep it confidential. So that's a voluntary participation process that the complaining citizen would have to agree to participate in. Uh, <clears throat> now, the advisory committee doesn't have any authority. They don't have any decision-making power, but they are the voice of the community. And so I want to hear what they have to say about something. And on the other side, I want them to know our side of the story as the police department, not just what someone is going to complain about in the newspaper or on Facebook. It's important that we have an opportunity to get our side of the narrative out. So that's what I say when I say they review our complaints. They also review uh, bias-based bias -based, uh, police policing complaints. Uh, in the state of Kansas, that's a, this uh, by law is one of the tasks that committees like this perform. And so if someone came in and said that our officers were behaving in a racist manner, we would investigate that and we would share that investigation with this committee as well as with our state attorney general's office. Uh, our advisory committee dispenses complaint forms. So one of the biggest movements in community policing is access to complaint on officers. This is, a, and it's proven to be very important in, in communities in my area. And so to accomplish this, uh, every officer is required to carry a complaint form in their patrol car. I carry them with me and my, my vehicle. Uh, all dispatchers are supposed to keep a copy of the complaint forms in dispatch and they hand them out when a citizen comes in and requests them. We also take complaints over the phone and we will investigate anonymous as well as third party complaints. So uh, you don't even have to have been involved in the incident. You could have witnessed it or maybe you could have just heard about it and called us. And if we can get enough information, we will look into that complaint. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but it, most of it goes to transparency and accountability. Uh, maybe the people that were involved in the complaint are intimidated by police. They're afraid to make a complaint because they think the officers are going to retaliate against them. But maybe someone across the street heard about it or a family member heard about it and they can report it to us. And it, even if we don't have a complainant, we can still find misconduct. And so that's important to, to allow people to do. So uh, the other thing is, is that we have a complaint form on our website. We also have a complaint. We also have a complaint form at our local libraries. And um, again, the members of the advisory count, uh, committee will give complaint forms out upon request and make sure that they get to my office. We, another citizen participation project is to have citizens involved in the hiring process. So we actually have a member of the Citizens Advisory Committee that will sit on the interview panel uh, for the uh, oral interviews whenever someone applies to be a police officer. If they make it through the testing process, then they go into the oral board process. And the oral board will consist of five people. Uh, 
usually three or four of them will be a police officer and one of them will be a member of our citizens advisory committee and they have been very impactful on our hiring process and have given us a lot of insight that a you know a typical police officer may not be looking at those things they may be looking at what they want to see in a police officer but a citizen wants to see different things in a police officer so they can help us detect problems or detect people that that they think will be uh, exceptionally good. And then the last thing, one of the last things that the advisory committee does is they also sit on the promotional process. So another aspect of community policing is involving the community in the promotional decision-making process. And so just like with the hiring process, our citizen uh, volunteer will sit on the oral boards to interview the people that are up for promotion to say sergeant, which is a shift supervisor or a detective. Uh, those are typically the promotions that, that come up. The next committee that we have is the, our traffic safety committee. And their job is to address traffic concerns or traffic safety concerns around town. Uh, in this community, for some reason, that I don't know, many intersections don't have stop signs or any other kind of traffic control on them. So, you know, you could have two vehicles meet at an intersection and neither one of them would be required to stop other than they're required to avoid a crash. So we look at our high crash areas and slowly develop um, traffic patterns in that area so that the traffic, so that drivers can predict you know, if there's gonna be a stop sign at the next intersection or not. And we've been able to lower our crash numbers by working our way around town and putting stop signs and yield signs in. Uh, we also address parking issues with this group, uh, bike paths, walking paths, sidewalks, those kind of things. Uh, we've even had a project with setting up school zones for lower speeds in the school zones, as well as uh, routing traffic through school zones. So it's a, uh, that committee has been surprisingly busy, believe it or not, but it's more geared towards engineering than other things. But again, that, and, and that, that committee serves an important role because again, when we look at community policing, we're looking at involving the citizens in solving problems in their community. So what, problems are there? What problems is a citizen going to bring to the police department? Um, is it appropriate for the police department to address that problem? If it is, then the police department and the citizens can work together to solve that problem. And the theory is, uh, but one of the reasons for that is, you know your neighborhood better than even the, you know, I may have been a police officer assigned to that area for, for a few years, but if I don't live in that neighborhood, I may not know it the way that you know it. Now we live in a small town, so our officers, it's about 12 square miles. So our officers know the community very well, but still you need that community input. You need the, the voice of the community to be heard. Uh, they need to steer the department in, in the direction that they want it to go because we serve our community. And so as servants to the community, uh, we need to be going the direction that, that they need us to go. So those are the citizen activities that our department has employed uh, to develop that relationship and strengthen that relationship. The next group of activities, and you know, I, the citizen activities to me are the ones that I value the most, but each one of these groups is important because if you don't cover citizens, officers, managers, and organization, if you don't have things going in each one of these categories, then you're not going to be successful in your community policing program. So they all deserve attention. Uh, it's just that the citizen one to me is the one where we focus most of our energy because I think that is where you get um, the most opportunity to allow citizen influence and influence the message that goes out to the community. So officer activities. Uh, one of the things in the article that we looked at was work regularly with detectives on cases and area of assignment. So on our department, uh, 
Well, let's go back. Uh, I worked in the state of Missouri in a small town called Monette, Missouri, uh, also about dead center of the United States. It's a couple hours east of where we are right now, where I'm at right now. And in that community, police officers, we would take the report. You know, if someone broke into your car, we would take a report, we'd write the report, and then it would go up uh, to be assigned out in case management. And typically, I never saw that case again. I usually didn't work on that case again, unless I just chose to. On our department, uh, under the community policing aspect, our officers are assigned to follow up on those cases and oftentimes will be the investigator that's assigned to that case. Uh, one of the reasons I like this is because, you know, you, you're not getting handed off to different people all the time unless it's a major case. The typical case, you'll <clears throat> work with the same officer throughout that case so you become familiar and more comfortable with that person. You're not getting interruptions where you're getting passed along. You don't feel like you're getting the runaround. The other thing I like is that our officers take personal ownership of the criminal activity in the area that they're assigned. So they become uh, personally frustrated if uh, someone commits a crime or when someone commits a crime in their area and they wanna fix it. They're driven to fix it. And consequently, our case closure rates are about double the national average. So our property crime case closure rates are some, uh, I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but they're, they're almost double what the uh, uh, case closure rates are across the country for police departments. And the same with our violent crime rate. Our violent crime cases are solved, uh, I wanna say like 80% or so of our violent crimes get solved. So I think that, that uh, shows an exceptional amount of efficiency for our department that we would close so many cases. Um, the other thing officers do is meet with community groups. So uh, we meet with uh, anti-drug and alcohol abuse programs for youth. Um, we have, uh, we also uh, look at safety issues for the youth and um, we're involved in after school programs. Uh, and we, we have a school in our community that is, serves the Southeast Kansas area for troubled kids that get kicked out of the regular school. We're still responsible to provide an education to them. So we've, we have a, a school specifically designed for problem students to come into. And so we're involved in, in teaching and that's and working with those students as well. The next thing that we employ is we work with other city agencies to solve neighborhood problems. So we have locally, we have a, a beautification committee. Uh, this community is a rural community and the economy is not the strongest economy. And so uh, we don't have a lot of problems with unemployment, but we do have a lot of problems with um, what places call blight or uh, uh, abandoned housing and uh, housing is falling in and it's a hazard and it and it's just an eyesore in the neighborhood and so drug users and drug makers will move into those houses and conduct criminal activity there'll be violent crime there as they fight over money and drugs there'll be a lot of theft in the particularly around that that home as drug users are traveling to and from that home to buy their their drugs they'll steal from houses around there to get merchandise to trade for drugs so we see a lot of problems when we see neighborhood blight we will see a, a criminal activity as soon to follow if it doesn't precede it and so uh, we work with our beautification committee uh, through crime analysis we actually try to seek out uh, where there's a, a hot spot of crime and then we'll go there and we'll work with the neighbors and we'll look around and inevitably we'll see an abandoned house or two that's probably contributing to the criminal problem in that area. And so we go after uh, dealing with that abandoned house. So we work with the beautification committee to try to uh, condemn those houses and then we push them in uh, and then, you know, backfill and have an empty lot there. Uh, but it takes away the shelter 
for people to, to stay, to crash there, uh, and it takes away the opportunity for them to be hidden doing drug activity inside of the home. We work with the community, so the officers work with the community to teach them how to address community problems. So we give training on crime prevention. As a matter of fact, that's a lot of our message is about accountability, how we keep officers accountable, how we track officer conduct. And then the next biggest message is probably what, what should the citizens be doing to improve the crime rate in our city? And again, we go back to Sir Robert Peel, uh, Peel's principles from the 1800s, uh, 1829, that uh, modern law enforcement is founded upon. Uh, the, you know, he founded the London, London Metropolitan Police Department. And, and that rule is that the police are the public and the public are the police. And so the community, the public, each one of us, whether we're a full-time police officer or not, is supposed to step up and prevent crime. So we talk to the citizens um, and try to, first of all, convince them that it is their responsibility and it is their problem and it is their fault when crime is increasing and we need your help. There's only 20 of us in a town of 9,000 people. We can't do it on our own. You know, we've, we've got over 4,000 addresses and intersections and over, you know, 10,000 vehicles, 18,000 vehicles inside this city. How could we possibly protect your vehicle from being broken into uh, when we only have two or three officers on duty at a time? So we need you to step up and fulfill your responsibility by locking your doors, putting your windows up, taking valuables out of the car. So we talk about different kinds of crime prevention. And then, as you probably know, we, have, uh, we don't have a lot of violent crime in the United States, but if you watch the media, they sure like to make it look like we do. And uh, so one of the things that has been uh, important to the community for about the last 20 years is response to active shooters. And so uh, we train our citizens on what to do if an active shooter comes into their church, their school, their workplace. We also train our officers, but it's a completely different program. So those are some of the ways that we teach residents how to address community problems. We also go into the schools. Now, uh, many schools have a school resource officer and we had one up until recently, but we decided that it, you know, we were doing community policing to our young people. But when we talked to our activist groups and, and uh, citizens around the community, they wanted us to expand the reach of our community policing. So, the way we did that was we ended our school resource officer program and that position was reassigned as a community policing officer. But that community policing officer still serves a role of going to the school and working with the school, with the kids in the schools and teaching classes in the schools. He just doesn't do it full time anymore. So he actually performs a similar role across the community. Excuse me. So some of the things that our school, uh, the programs that we work on in the school, we have a seat belt program that we try to get kids heavily involved in. Our uh, community policing officer plays the guitar. And so for many years, he has on his own time voluntarily had a guitar club in the high school and he meets with these kids in the evening once a week and they just have a jam session with guitars together. And it's built a lot of strong relationships and uh, led to some good police work as students feel more comfortable talking to him. We've also had students with mental illness come forward and let him know that they were thinking about suicide or thinking about running away or maybe they were having real uh, serious family problems at home. And so, you know, this was an opportunity for a police officer to intervene. And if, if it wasn't a police issue, then maybe he would get them in touch with a mental health professional or other government services that can assist that student. Uh, another program, National Walk to School Day, and so the officers will walk to school with kids in different neighborhoods. Uh, he gives classes about bullying, peer pressure, stranger danger, drug safety, uh, bike and pedestrian safety, and then anti-drug and 
uh, alcohol classes. So those are some, those are most of the, excuse me while I top off here, get a little thirsty while we're rattling on. Uh, those are, that's the officer activities that our department has chosen to focus on and that's a sample of them. We're doing more than what I'm giving you right now, but these were things that were uh, the, the bigger things to discuss. So as you recall, uh, the four categories, citizens, officers, managers, organizations. So what as, as managers, what are we doing? Now the, the structure of our department, um, it's just myself as the, as the chief. And then uh, I have a police captain that she is second in command. And so that's all the management personnel that we have in our department. We just have two layers of management. And then below that, I guess would be our supervisor. So I guess we have uh, three layers of management in our organization. So you have your first line supervisor, middle manager, and then your uh, director or your chief. So as you go through the checklist in the article, some of the, the things that we are using at the managerial level is a redesign organization to support problem solving efforts. So the way, what we did here was we created the community policing coordinator position. And uh, that position, let me pull up my notes. Uh, Well, I'm not seeing my notes on that position, so I'll just power through here. But that position um, serves, it has many roles in the community. So it's kind of a, the school resource officer. Uh, it, that position manages all of our interns and volunteer programs. They do our internal affairs investigation. So if you were to come in and make a complaint on a police officer, chances are that case would be assigned to our community policing coordinator. And again, um, that may not make sense, but if you think about it, uh, complaints, we view complaints as being one of the biggest opportunities for us to develop transparency with our community, as well as trust, uh, giving them the opportunity to have a voice. And so those are just some of the things that that position is responsible for. He also handles our background investigations. So if you were to apply with our police department for a job, then he would be the one that would investigate your personal life and your work life to see if you're the kind of person that we would like to have in our organization. Uh, managers also regularly meet with community, community leaders. So in our community, of course, we have activist groups just like uh, many communities across the country do. Uh, we have one group is the Progressive Ministers Union, and this is a group of African American pastors that are church leaders in, in our area. And so I meet with them about once a year and discuss things, uh, particularly topics concerning race and diversity on the police department and bias based policing. You know, are you racially profiling? Those kind of things. So we meet once basically once a year, we get together for breakfast on a Sunday morning and we talk about whatever is of concern to them. We have a diversity task force in our community and it's uh, somewhat similar to this, but uh, we want a community, our desire is to have a community that is open to all people, regardless of your ace, uh, age, race, gender, um, uh, sexual orientation, all these kinds of things. We want to be a welcoming community. We want to be uh, equitable to everybody here. And so uh, we have membership on that task force and uh, it's a volunteer position, you know, it's a volunteer task force in our community. And right now the topic of discussion with them is uh, police reforms. And as an example of what that community does, you know, whenever there is, uh, if you remember the Pulse nightclub shooting down in Florida, they they will have a vigil when some kind of tragedy such as that strikes. And so uh, many communities across the United States had protests 
and terrible rioting that followed the George Floyd murder in Minneapolis at the hands of Officer Chauvin. Our diversity task force worked with the police department and instead of having protests and riots in our community, we had, uh, we had a unity event. And so myself and one of the African-American pastors in the Progressive Ministers Union, we spoke to our community at a, at a big event. And that, you know, we were able to do that before the protesters came to town. And so we stole that negative energy. We, we removed the opportunity for, for negative energy to lead that conversation. And that is, that is one of the benefits of having a strong community policing program. If our community didn't trust us, if the diversity task force didn't trust us, if the progressive ministers union didn't trust us, if our local Black Lives Matter didn't trust us, we would not have had that opportunity to lead that narrative. As a matter of fact, every uh, major, I say major community. So again, I live in a rural area. So we live in a town of about 9,000. The town 15 minutes away is about 10,000. And there's a town about 30 minutes away that's around 10 or 12,000. <clears> As, as an example, both of those communities had more than one protest. Um, now they went well and they worked with their local police department, but I think it speaks volumes to the value of community policing. When you see, we did not have a protest. We had a community unity event where the community came together and we talked about things. So um, Pastor Charles Barker spoke about uh, race in law enforcement and some of the tragedies and inequities that we've had in our country's history. The topic that I discussed was uh, accountability. How do we in the Independence Police Department hold our officers accountable? And so we talked about policies and use of force policies and investigation, internal investigations, how complaints are handled, all those kinds of things. Uh, and again, I, I just, if for no other reason than those things, than those benefits, I think community policing is, is, is extremely important. It prevented, uh, it prevented some tragedy in our community that you saw in other cities across the country where things were destroyed and, and uh, the community rose up, uh, not the community, but small groups rose up against the police and against the uh, economic well-being of, of cities across our country. We didn't have the violence. We didn't have the protest even. So um, yes, maybe community policing may not be a crime control model, but what if the relationship, what is the value of that community policing relationship? And I think there is a tangible value in that. Um, the fear of crime, when that relationship with the community is strengthened, then we see that fear of crime in a community goes down. So ironically, maybe crime doesn't go down. Maybe, I don't know that it would go up, but maybe it just plateaus. Maybe it has no impact on crime at all and you attack crime in other venues or other programs. But that fear of crime going down, that trust in the police department going up, that trust in local government going up, that that is a uh, the way that the the George Floyd uh, protests and the police reform protests have played out across the country. There is a strong, tangible benefit to why you should have a good relationship with your community because we avoided all of those complications. Uh, let's see. So. Uh, establish interagency relationships. So the next thing in community policing for the management section of the department to do is establish those interagency relationships. So here, uh, when I came here in 2016, one of the first things that I did was reach out to our prosecutors, our city and county prosecutors, uh, nearby county prosecutors, um, and nearby city police chiefs and county sheriffs and we sit, actually, uh, we're about 15 minutes from the, uh, about 30 minutes from the state of Oklahoma. So we're very close to the Oklahoma border and here in Southeast Kansas. 
So we reached across the state line and included them as well. And so we had uh, about 22 different law enforcement agencies that were represented in our interagency uh, monthly get togethers. And again, these would typically be police chiefs, uh, sheriffs, county sheriffs, and then sometimes it would be the second in command of those organizations. Sometimes we'd have uh, dispatch supervisors. Uh, occasionally we'd have investigators from other organizations. The value of the, this, uh, the tangible benefit here is, is when you have a, an emergency come up, you know everyone, you have their phone number, and when you need something, you can call them. Uh, one example is we had a major, um, we had a major industrial fire in the town about 20 minutes from us, and uh, the water, the river, in this area of the state, we get our water out of the rivers. And so, you know, we don't drink it straight from the river, it's piped into a treatment plant, but still our water comes from the surface. And we had a major industrial fire in a town called Neodeche. And uh, they needed help from all over the countryside. So ended up going up there and working with them. And the town about 30 minutes south of us has a hazardous materials response team. So, you know, we were able to coordinate together, bring them up. Uh, we were able to call all the water departments downstream for all those communities downstream of the event. And before all the industrial contaminants that were, you know, when they were fighting the fire, there was a lot of uh, industrial contaminants washed into the river. And so we were able to call and get a hold of all those cities down the river going into Oklahoma even and let them know, hey, you need to fill, treat as much water as you can, fill every wa raw water tank that you can, fill all your water towers with treated water because you're going to have to shut off your intakes, you know, say, in 12 hours, it'll be to Independence. In 15 hours, it'll be to Coffeyville. And in 24 hours, it'll be down into the Nowata County, Oklahoma. So we were able to contact all those entities and let them know. Uh, we were able to get different resources from across our region to come into that emergency and help us out. And that was, and, and we also were able to communicate with each other. We, we knew where to go. We knew who had what equipment. So we knew that when this event happened, we could go to Neodeche Police Department and they would provide us all with handheld radio so we could have common uh, radio communication with each other. So that's the value that that brings to your community is everybody knows each other and is aware of what each other is capable of prior to a major emergency happening. The next thing that management does is conduct crime analysis. So we're a smaller department. We don't have enough uh, personnel to have a full-time crime analyst, but um, one, of, one of the tasks that I try to do every month is sit down and look at our, our crime statistics and then also do some crime mapping and try to look for problem areas and problem uh, categories. And then we try to develop uh, strategies to address those problems. And we typically see the same problems in the same locations over time. As all criminologists are aware, uh, crime is relatively, while it is not evenly distributed across the geography, we know that it is uh, consistently uh, distributed across that. In other words, uh, where your problem crime is today is probably where your problem crimes are gonna be in 15 years from now. So we know that's relatively stable. So we don't see a lot of change there, but that is something that uh, we do as far as management and their contribution to uh, community policing. <clears throat> and then uh, we work on different community or uh, different problem oriented policing projects. So I'm sure uh, you guys are familiar with the problem oriented policing model, <clears throat> which is closely related to the community policing model. And so uh, as citizens and officers detect problems or as the organization detects problems and we start to develop responses to those problems, then uh, one of my roles is to determine what are we going to invest in. For example, I would like to do a street light project. We don't have a lot of street lighting in portions of town 
and we all uh, know what the literature says about the impact that street lighting can have on crime. And so uh, I believe that that's an important project. However, it's also very expensive because the city has to pay to have the lights put in and then the city has to pay the electric bill for those lights. So <clears throat> that is probably not something that we're going to uh, get heavily into anytime soon. But that is one of my goals uh, before I leave here is to develop some street lighting projects. So now we've talked about citizens, officers, and managers and what they contribute to the uh, community policing process. And so now I'm winding down, I'm getting into the last section. So I'm almost done with uh, most of what I have to talk about, but I can go in depth into some of it um, if anyone, you know, if you have questions or want to hear more about a certain topic, I can, should be able to go in depth to it. So the last group is organization. So what is our department as a whole doing to contribute to community policing? Um, one of the, one of the ways, again, community policing is about voice. Uh, transparency and communication and so how do you do that and you you know you have to pick many different ways to do that and that's where the organization's responsibilities lie so uh, one way to open those doors that we've talked about several ways to open doors to communication your citizen volunteers your citizen committees uh, having those officers out in the community <clears throat> Uh, giving citizens training on crime prevention and those kind of things. But you you have to employ as many different methods to, to reach out to the community and listen to people as you can and create as many opportunities as you can for, for communication to flow back and forth between the police department and the citizenry. And so we use serve, one of the ways that we do that is we use surveys. I'm sure you guys are... Uh, probably know more about surveys than I ever will uh, at your level of education and training. So what surveys do we use? Um, we have an, an annual survey and so we, well, we use these surveys, number one, to determine uh, again, where, where does the community want us to go? Uh, what, is, what are the community's needs? What is the community doing? And so we wanna know what, they, what citizens on the street uh, think the police should be doing. The next thing is uh, we want to know what is your opinion on the level of service that we provide? So are you satisfied? Uh, do you think that the officers did a good job with your case? Did the officers ignore you? Did you get good customer service? Uh, were you treated with respect? Um, you know, because we need to know those things because that can direct our training internally for the department. Uh, we can give customer service training. We can give uh, uh, de-escalation training, you know, su surviving verbal conflict, uh, verbal judo type training. <clears throat> and so those, and again, that, that, those types of trainings for officers go back to developing that relationship. If you uh, felt respected by the officer, then that relationship with the department is going to be strengthened. So we use surveys to get uh, satisfaction with services received. What is your perception of fear of crime? Uh, what prioritization of problems would you like to see on the department? Remember a minute ago, I said that to me, one of the things I wanna do, uh, two things, I, two overarching goals for me before I leave are to have every intersection inside of our city controlled with a stop sign or a traffic light. Uh, mostly stop signs. Traffic lights are pretty well gonna be at your major intersections, but you know we all understand that. But the point is, is I want a traffic control at every intersection in our community to keep cars from sliding into each other. The other project that I'm really pushing, like I said a second ago, is I would like to see uh, improved street lighting, particularly in our problem areas. So, but, you know, I need to hear from the citizens because they may not be concerned with uh, street lighting maybe they have a concern that's more pressing that I'm not aware of that, you know, for whatever reason, hasn't been brought to police attention attention. And remember, you know, you have the, you have the funnel, you know, when we talk about uh, crime, 
the criminal justice system, you have that funnel where, you know, depending on how strong the relationship is with the community, uh, not all crime gets reported. We know that. In some places, as little as 33% uh, of the crime, one third of the crime gets reported, uh, maybe even less due to a poor relationship between the police and the community. But we also see that in communities where we have a strong relationship, we know that more crime, more percentage of crime is reported, that 50, maybe even higher percent of crime is reported. So we really don't know the whole picture of crime in the area if we just look at reported crime. Uh, and so, you know, that one of the reasons that I think our crime rates are inflated in our community is because we have that strong relationship and our citizens trust us and believe in us and are more likely to report crime to us. And so, uh, I do, and that may not be happening in other towns around us, but it's certainly happening here. So at any rate, if you're not getting all the crime reported to you and you're not, no one is, then you can't, you, you may not be aware of issues that are happening. And so, you know, you need to survey for that. While they may not report it, they may fill out a survey and let you know what's happening. So you can compare those surveys to your reported crime and uh, take a look at what's happening. And that may help drive prioritization. They also will rate the department on, uh, how good of an organization that we are, how well do we perform our role in the community. We, the, the other, one of the other kinds of surveys that we use is a citizen contact survey. So this one goes out quarterly to a small percentage of people that are contacted by an officer. So we'll have about 17,000 contacts a year in our, uh, for our department. And so we don't, obviously, we're not going to take 17,000 surveys uh, when we only have one or two people that are going to be able to compile the results and, and analyze them. But on a quarterly basis, we'll send surveys out to about 10% of the people that are contacted. That survey is designed to, um, what was the level of satisfaction with your contact with an officer? So this is someone that may have called in for a police report. And this is done randomly. They're not selected. They're just chosen randomly. Uh, so it could be someone that called in a police report. It could be someone that was pulled over on a traffic stop. It could be someone that was arrested uh, for, who knows, maybe domestic violence, maybe shoplifting. But um, we're going to ask them to, you know, we're going to send them this anonymous survey and ask them to complete it. And if they want to identify themselves, they can. And most times people will. We, one aspect that the organization can do for community policing is alternative reporting methods. So do you take reports over the phone? Yes, we do. Uh, we don't like to, um, but we will if we, if we need to. Uh, one project that we've been working on is online reporting. So we're trying to set it up to where if you have a minor report, there's no evidence to collect, there's no pictures to take, uh, and it's a misdemeanor crime, then you can report that online. So we haven't got it in place yet, but it's something, it's a project, it's a goal to where uh, you could go to our police department website and you could just fill out your own police report and it would auto-populate into our records management system. So we could still detect crime occurring in a neighborhood but we wouldn't have to send a resource out to take that report that probably wouldn't get solved anyways, but it still helps us have a picture of what's happening in that area. And so the, as you know, like as, as we can see from organizations like Amazon, um, the less friction that they can make in the purchasing process, then the more product they're going to sell, the more money they're going to make, uh, the more, you know, the more sales act, uh, the more individual sale activities are gonna occur. And so why would it be any different in law enforcement? The easier we can make it for you to make a police report, the more likely you are to make that police report. So uh, that's the, the impetus behind the uh, alternative reporting method. Victim assistance. So 
community policing involves victim assistance programs. And this may be uh, financial assistance, it may be um, uh, transportation assistance to and from trials if they have to appear as a witness. Uh, maybe it's psychological counseling for violent crime victims or domestic violence victims, that kind of thing. So we do have victims assistance that we uh, participate in. We don't run that program. The state attorney general's office runs it, but we will uh, make sure we're, we're sort of a gatekeeper for that. So we, we will make sure that the victims of crime are aware of that program and that they're able to uh, contact, you know, we'll give them the form so that they can contact people for that program. Uh, then again, we go to the police youth programs, which I already talked about earlier with our guitar clubs, our after school programs, our safety belt programs, our anti-drug programs, which also fall under the next category, which is drug education programs in school. You guys have probably heard of DARE, which is uh, drug, alcohol, drug and alcohol resistance education. We don't participate in DARE. Uh, the research on DARE's impactfulness is somewhat ambiguous but we do participate in other programs that are designed to um, keep kids from going, you know, from experimenting in drugs. Let's see. Again, we go to regularly scheduled meetings with community groups. So once a month, uh, myself or the captain or our community policing coordinator will go to the diversity task force meetings uh, this month. I'll be meeting with a subcommittee from the Diversity Task Force on police reforms and letting them know, hey, these are the reforms that are already in progress on our department. These are the reforms that I think we would be good for our department. And these are reforms that I think are misleading and, and uh, you know, aren't, aren't really appropriate for our department. And then we're gonna talk about what are some of the reforms that our state legislature is looking at right now and our governor is pushing. Uh, we have another community group as I regularly will address uh, business leaders in our community. Once a month, the first Friday of every month, our Chamber of Commerce hosts a first Friday get together in the morning. And so for, uh, you, they have various speakers. And so you get a 10 or 15 minute opportunity to, uh, again, communicate with the community, put our narrative out there. So that's why that's important. And we also have a, uh, for our, our chamber also does celebrate independence once a quarter. And so uh, maybe every year or so I get invited to, or a member of my staff will get invited to speak at uh, Celebrate Independence. And that's a lunch where people buy a ticket, $10 a plate to go to this lunch and hear from different speakers in our area. Uh, police, uh, you know, one of the things that we do with these regularly scheduled meetings is uh, we talk about police accountability. Um, and when we talk about police accountability, we're talking, we, we tell them what our hiring practices are. So we'll go in depth into our background process and the whole entire hiring process, what the uh, state law minimums are for someone to be, you know, uh, these, you. We have state laws that if you've ever done these different things, you're disqualified from being a police officer. So we talk about those different things as well. Uh, we have in-car cameras, we have body cameras. We record all of the phone lines coming into our station. We record all of the radio frequencies that we broadcast on and receive on. Uh, we don't currently, but we have in the past used GPS monitoring on our cars. Uh, this was important. This, this is a good uh, piece of accountability because one, it tells you where the officers are at at all times. So it's also an officer safety tool. Uh, if something happens and the officer can't communicate or we're not hearing from them, we know where to start looking uh, where their car was where their car is parked at. It also tells us how fast the officer is driving and where the officer is driving, where the officer is spending a lot of time. Is an officer spending too much time in the station? Are they spending time at at, uh, at home or with a significant other when they shouldn't be? Are they taking too long a lunch break? So we have some accountability from uh, body cam or from uh, GPS monitoring. So uh, 
And another area that we do accountability in, is, again, is bias-based policing. So we monitor, um, our department voluntarily participates, officers are by policy required to fill out a uh, bias-based policing form for every self-initiated activity. So what this means is that, you know, when you get called, when someone calls into dispatch and they request an officer, that we don't track. If they're following up on an investigation, we don't track. Those are things you cannot control who you come into contact with because <clears throat> the investigation is going to take you where the investigation takes you. And if a citizen calls in to make a report, you have to deal with that. So, you know, you can't choose to be bigoted in those activities. However, um, you can choose when you see someone walking through a neighborhood at night and you think, I'm going to go talk to them and see what they're doing. Um, <clears throat> you know, if, if an officer is doing that based on race, we have a problem. So we can't, we can't allow that to happen. Or if you're pulling cars over based on race, we can't allow that to happen. Or <clears throat> If you're making, you know, pulling cars over and making arrests based on race or trying to search a vehicle because of someone's race, we can't let those things happen. So we monitor for that. So uh, they're required to fill out a form and there's 23 data points on that form for self-initiated activity. And it's designed to detect bias in uh, policing race, gender, and ethnicity. And uh, again, we look at, <coughs> pardon me, are they citing uh, people disproportionately? Are they arresting people disproportionately? Are they searching people disproportionately? So those are the things we look for. And we monitor that at the individual officer level. And we also monitor that at the department level. And then we report those numbers every year to our community. And now we don't report individual officer, we report the department. When it comes to individual officers, we will address that individual officer with training and discipline and give them an opportunity to uh, learn how to be equitable. We do regular radio spots. So uh, different sponsors will uh, pay for say 30 seconds of airtime. And so, you know, they may say, uh, I'll, I'll do a commercial for um, how to drive in the snow or, you know, don't, don't leave your kids and your pets in a car in the summertime, um, safe driving habits, uh, crime prevention tech, you know, ha habits that you should have in your life, those kind of things. So I'll do a brief 30 second commercial. During the pandemic, uh, I did several public service announcements regarding uh, the governor's executive orders. So our governor would write an executive order and under our emergency management laws, the governor's executive order would become law for a time frame. And so, you know, I would explain to them that yes, police can come in and enforce, uh, you know, too many people gathered in one place, people not staying six feet apart, that kind of thing. So, you know, we, in, in, instead of enforcing things, we try to sell things to the community and, and, hey, this is the law, but here's why it's important that you follow it. So we, we, would, we use that as more of a communication and sales pitch to try to win people over to our side so that we don't have to go out and make hard feelings with our community by enforcing laws that they may not support us enforcing. And so, you know, I may give an ad on that. And then at the end of the commercial, it'll say this ad brought to you by Lee's heating and cooling or the car shop or, you know, a local restaurant or something, you know, any business around town will buy those radio spots and, and then they get their name announced at the end of the commercial. I also do uh, third Thursday interviews. So the third Thursday of every month, um, typically I will do an interview with uh, the talk radio station uh, nearby. So, <clears throat> And again, the same topics that I've talked about prior, you know, it's, it's all about accountability, communication, how do we do certain things, 
And then uh, what are our crimes that what are our statistics as an organization? And when I when I talk about, you know, what our statistics are as, as an organization, I go off some other research and that research says, you know, what is happening that ought not to be happening? And what are the police doing about what ought not to be happening? And so I look at those categories and design uh, what's reported to the community around that. However, uh, some other things that get reported to the community come from uh, the police chief's advisory committee. So some of the statistics that we report in our annual year end report will be uh, directly at their request. So they wanna know how many juveniles versus adults are arrested, or they wanna know about bias-based policing statistics and use of force or bias-based police st statistics and uh, uh, searches or bias-based police statistics in the schools. What is the school, what is the officer that works in the school or what is the department as a whole? What are their activities in the schools? How many students are being arrested out of the schools for different criminal activities? So uh, let's see, what else? Uh, one of the other aspects that the organization does for community policing is working with code enforcement to eliminate crime by using building codes and order maintenance uh, ordinances. So we have, for example, we have ordinances that you can't leave uh, a malfunctioning car parked in the street. It has to be legally licensed and it has to be being driven. It can't have a flat, it can't have the hood up when you're changing the oil or pulling the alternator off of it. You can't work on your car in the street. You can't leave it parked there in the street while you're working on it. Same goes in the yard. You can't park in your yard. You can't leave a car like an abandoned car in your yard like that, unlicensed and all that. So there's ordinances. You have to mow. You can't, you can't let your grass grow really tall. Uh, you have to maintain your home to a minimum standard, those kind of things. So we work with our code enforcement to eliminate crime that way. So in other words, if we come to your house and we think you're dealing drugs, but maybe we can't prove it. Well, okay, we can't arrest you for drug activity because we can't prove beyond a reasonable doubt. We can't develop probable cause that you're involved in the drug trade. We can't get enough to get a search warrant, uh, you know, enough information and evidence to gather a search warrant from a judge. So, but we look around, you're not mowing your yard, you got a car up on blocks and um, your roof is very damaged and, and about to fall in. So we'll, we'll, we will contact our code enforcement officer and have our code enforcement officer start writing you citations for the yard, write you citations for the car, write you citations for your uh, lack of home maintenance. And by doing these things, um, you know, I openly admit to our community, we cannot eliminate crime. We can drive it down, we can make things better, but we cannot get rid of all crime in our community. But what we can do is make it so dangerous for criminals, you know, we can make them so worried that they're going to get caught that, you know what, let's go over to this other town and let's sell our dope over there. And that way, uh, it drives them out of our community and makes things in our community better. And so, okay, fine. We're not going to catch you for, you know, whatever illegal activity that you're involved in, but chances are you got some problems on your property. So we're just going to start prosecuting you for that. And eventually you're gonna get tired of our attention, either from the police or from the code enforcement. And you're gonna to go to another community that maybe has lax, more lax code enforcement laws. And uh, uh, so, so that's uh, one of the creative ways to get around code enforcement issues um, or to get around crime issues. Let's see, we do geographical crime analysis that I talked about earlier that helps with resource allocation as well. And then um, one final project that I'm working on is uh, with our investigators is to develop a parolee prob probationer uh, follow-up program. So we're trying to work with, uh, this step is integration with community corrections. So when people come out of jail, they come out of prison, they're on probation, they're on parole. They have to report into their parole officer every month. Um, you know, you guys know this as well as I do. When you look at the literature, 
three to five percent of offenders are responsible for about half the crime in our communities. So if we can focus resources on these, this very small group of offenders, then we know we can drive crime rate down. And so uh, my goal is to work with our community corrections officers and our investigators on our department, and they will come together and they will go out and meet with these people once a month and say, knock on their door, how you doing, what's going on? Uh, in, in our country, uh, if you're on probation or parole, you have fewer civil rights and fewer constitutional protections. And so we're allowed to do searches uh, because you've already been through the court system. You've already gone through due process. So we've already covered that with you on this particular crime. So as long as you're still under punishment for that crime, then we can do a search. And so we just say, hey, we're gonna search your home, make sure you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, make sure you're out looking for a job, make sure you're not offending. And so if we can you know, follow up with those people, one of two things happens, either they get right or they get gone because maybe they go to the next town because the next town police department isn't gonna come by and search their house every month. So that's one of the goals that I have to work with uh, community corrections. And then uh, that, that, that actually that is uh, the last, that's the last step on uh, the different activities that we're either doing or trying to start doing in our organization for community policing. So that's uh, all I have. If uh, you, this is the time to open it up for questions, I'll let the moderators take back over the class. Uh, yes, sir. thank you so much. Uh, we have a few questions from the participants. Uh, okay. First question is, uh, what's the law in drink and driving cases out there in Kansas and uh, punishment and the penalty imprisonments you can if you can brief us about it. Uh, the law is well, you're, it's uh, the prima facie standard is 0.08% blood alcohol content as far as alcohol goes. As far as drugs go, there is no prima facie standard. We don't look at drug levels per se. We just look at, is there drug pre drugs present in the blood? And if so, was there impairment? Um, <clears throat> that's the typical process. So what happens is the officer detects impairment in your driving or pulls you over or comes into contact with, while you're driving for some reason. And uh, they detect alcohol or drug impairment then they would run you through the field sobriety test. Um, if it's your first one, then you get arrested. We would gather the evidence, the physical evidence from your body, whether it be breath or blood, and then you would be cited. You get a citation and go to court. You could be sentenced to jail for a brief time. More than likely, you're gonna get a fine. Uh, the more times that you're arrested in a certain time frame, you could eventually go to prison, but it's, uh, not often. All right. Uh, the next question is, uh, why community policing has been given more importance than individuals' right to defend himself by the way they want to? Um, you're talking about a, a person's right to defend themselves in court, like once they've been charged? Yeah, 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 exactly. I think that is what the mm -hmm. participant okay. meant. Um, <clears throat> whenever they go to court, that's that's outside, that's a different branch. So in, in our form of government, the courts are separate from the police. So there's the lawmakers, the legislators that make law, they're independent. And then there's the police who carry out the law, we're independent. And then there is the court system, which uh, in determines the penalty for violating the law and they're independent of us. So the rights that a person has when they go to court are independent of what I do in my profession and they're all governed under the constitution. Uh, and actually um, the only people that have any protections when they come into court are those that are being accused of a crime. So that really isn't something, now we have to respect their constitutional rights in our uh investigatory process and if we violate any of those then of course the evidence isn't allowed into court but that's really about the limitation that or the impact that we would have on that did i answer that question 
Uh, I guess so. Uh, okay. Then the next uh, question is: uh, Community policing sometimes looks like the breach of privacy and infringement of personal rights. Then, how an authority can maintain the discipline in the society if enforced, it's a breach. So, if it doesn't work, uh, it's backing off from the responsibility. Um, actually, in under our on, under our nation's laws, uh, community policing is actually more of a uh, a due process uh, model in that um, we try to uh, ex maybe not expand people's rights, but we have more respect for people's civil rights uh, under the the uh, community policing model. Um, it's uh, it, you know, a, a crime control model would be more concerned with uh, efficiently arresting people and getting them into court, whereas a uh, community policing model is more about um, preventing, developing relationships, preventing people from going into court, and then providing, uh, to some degree, some alternative programs that I really didn't go into because that's not what we do on our side. But... Um, I think maybe the question comes from the uh, community corrections involvement. And at that point, that person's already been through court. And so as long as they're under uh, court supervision for that particular charge, yes, they do have some reduction in civil rights. And so that would be the only part of uh, community policing where you might see uh, more activity that would be perceived as reducing rights. So. Um, but as a whole, community policing, I think, is more about uh, not infringing on those rights and being more equitable with your uh, conduct. Okay. Uh, we have one more question, sir. Uh, how can these measures be applicable in place uh, where communities are slightly bigger? Will it be as successful with a larger bunch of people as well? You know, that's really where we see, um, as you guys know, you know, the bigger sample that you have to, to, to look at and analyze, the more accurate your analysis becomes. So we see that in major communities, um, you, you see the impact of, say, uh, hot spots policing and other evidence, uh, problem-oriented policing like the the lights, uh, street lights, that kind of thing. So actually, um, I would say that, that it's more impactful in the bigger communities because you have to be more intentional. You know, I'm in a town of 9,000 people. So it's it, nearly everywhere I go, most of the people that I come across, if I'm at the store or a restaurant or out in public, the vast majority of the people that I'm going to come into contact with, they're going to recognize me. And they're going to know me and a few of them i'm going to you know probably a few hundred i'm going to be acquainted with who they are as well so in a small community it's not as important i don't think uh, because we just have a better opportunity to interact with our community everybody knows every single officer on this department when they see them around town just about the major cities is really where community policing is needs to be applied in an intentional manner. Now, we apply it intentionally, but the big cities are where it's very important to go about it intentionally because you just don't have those same opportunities. But one final thought on that is look at the research. And as you know, when you evaluate the research, you don't see um, researchers coming in and studying small towns, say, uh, as a matter of fact, I'm only aware of one, one or two studies that looked at communities smaller than 50,000 even, which is significantly larger than us. So most of your studies are going to be in major cities to evaluate all of the, actually all the studies that I'm aware of to evaluate any of the programs that I discussed this morning. All the studies that I have reviewed when I was in grad school and since all look at major cities, you know, probably 500,000, at least 200,000, if not bigger, and probably more along the lines of 500,000 and bigger. So that's, that is where community policing really has to be intentional. You have to have uh, groups of the organization that are specifically assigned full-time to work on community policing and be intentional about it. 
all right uh, thank you sir uh, one more question from the participant uh, what's the jurisdiction of the community police officers and what's their jurisprudence uh, their jurisdiction is the same as any other officer if they're a certified police officer. So, uh, and in our, our department, we have our police officer is a certified police officer. So typically, um, in, in the community level, uh, you won't see limitations on uh, law enforcement powers. Uh, the only places you're going to see that are in specialty law enforcement organizations like maybe the Highway Patrol or uh, maybe like park police or college police, somebody like that. But um, so the jurisdiction is going to, they're going to have the same authorities as any other officer in their community. So our jurisdiction, of course, would be inside the city limits of independence and our community policing coordinator would have the same, um, the same authorities. As far as jurisprudence goes, uh, I think, I think the question is, um, you know, what's the discretion of that officer? Uh, and that, that officer's primary role isn't necessarily enforcing law. If they see a problem, then they certainly can enforce the law. But their primary role is to get people, is to communicate, develop relationships, and also connect people with the resources that they need. All right, so that I think that answers the question. Uh, there's one more question from the participant. Uh, from your experience while implementing geographically focused uh, policing initiatives, uh, maybe the crimes hotspots or problem buildings, have you seen a displacement of crime to other parts of the same or to another jurisdiction? Uh, and what is the strategy that is employed by the local police in Kansas? to reduce the crime when there is a gap in the police public ratio because in india the police public ratio is around 316 to uh, 1 lakh okay so the gap here is probably going to be more like a thousand to one um but as far as um as far as hot spots policing goes the literature shows that there's actually uh, an increased reduction outside of the hotspot instead of a reduction, instead of a displacement. Um, as far as displacement goes, I've, we have not formally studied that. So we just address hotspots. And as that hotspot cools, we will go look at another hotspot. And for us, there's, again, you know, the bigger the sample, the more accurate the information you can draw from it. So in a town of 9,000, we're not going to have those big samples uh, of intense hotspots like they have in a major city. So we don't really look at necessarily displacement, although I would say we probably do displace crime uh, more than, say, the major hotspot projects in big cities because they see increased reductions, whereas our goal is to just push the problem outside of our jurisdiction and then work with other jurisdictions that need help. Um, because, you know, crime crime doesn't limit itself by political boundaries. So we try to work with other uh, pol pol political boundary entities and uh, help them as things improve in our area. Correct, correct. Uh, so uh, one more question. Uh, how to manage the community policing along with criminal investigation and law and order simultaneously having limited manpower and policing? Uh, because in India, we are having uh, less manpower in proportion to the population. So kindly, if you could suggest uh, what things the government should implement in India for better policing. Uh, it's all about relationships and, and customer service. And sometimes it's what's most important is uh, not what you say, but how you say it. So when you, um, you know, you need to recognize the human uh, universals such as people would rather be asked to do something versus told to do something. People would rather have options versus being given ultimatums. And so we, we treat people with respect. We listen to what they have to say. If we have to arrest them and they want to resist, then we'll say something like, look, you know, I really need you to cooperate. Is there anything I can do or say to get you to, uh, to uh, voluntarily go into these handcuffs? Because we don't want you to get more criminal charges. So we, we try to recognize those human universals of listening, respect, uh, options, uh, and, and try to give someone the feeling of control in that scenario. And that, again, it's all about relationships.
sir thank you so much uh, i think so we are done with the questions uh, lance sir if you could conclude Uh, so there's one more question. Uh, how effective is crime mapping and the intervention based on it? Uh, can you give me that question one more time, please? Uh, how effective is crime mapping and the intervention based on it? Um, for us, I don't know that it's terribly impactful, just again, because we just don't have those... Um, those big numbers, but in the bigger cities, it's pretty impactful because we see that just with the power law of, you know, when I talked about community corrections, we talked about three to 5% of offenders are responsible for about half the crime. We also know that about three to 5% of the addresses and intersections in an area are res uh, responsible for nearly half the crime in that jurisdiction. So it's pretty impactful in the major cities. For us, I haven't seen it be quite as impactful. Just, and I think again, it comes to sample size and us being a small town. All right, sir. Uh, thank you so much. I think uh, you have answered the queries. Uh, Lance, sir, you're there. Th thank you for having me, ma'am. No, I. Uh, in the comments, everybody has mentioned it was an excellent session. Uh, so people have really liked uh, your suggestions and your views on it.